and we're going to continue into the evolutionary religion here to talk about the aspect of we're going to, we're going to talk about radiometric dating today. And I know this is going to be kind of a boring topic for some people, but this is something we need to go through because what this is a deception of a religion, okay? We need to understand this is a parlor trick. It's a magician's illusion. And I'm going to show you exactly, I'll give you examples to show you exactly how, how this is a magician's illusion. A lot of people have been led to believe, and especially over the past 50 years, a lot of people have been led to believe, like the old phrase you used to hear, you know, doesn't carbon dating prove evolution? I've heard that question asked so many times. And today that question is being asked a lot less, and that is thankfully due to a lot of the effort of some Christian organizations that have been trying to educate people on that. This has not been an effort of evolutionists, okay, because they don't really care what people believe about it so long as you believe in evolution. But it's been a lot of the Christian organizations that have been trying to preach the truth about what they're actually saying on this. Now, an evolutionist will also admit the same thing that I will say here, is that carbon dating does not prove evolution, okay, because carbon, it, carbon dating is not any good for past 50,000 years, and I'll show you why very shortly. So they will say that too. However, the impression is always given in mainstream media uh, and in textbooks for a long time over over the past 50 years that carbon dating somehow does this, okay? And it's only been recently that they've kind of backed off of that, that impression that was giving people. But the reason that was kind of used is because if carbon dating was good for 50,000 years and they were dating things that were older than 6,000 years old, therefore they would reach the conclusion that the earth is older than 6,000 years, which means the Bible is wrong. And so that, that's why they were, people were viewing this as some sort of challenge to the Bible. Well, carbon dating was in, it was in 1950, the, a guy named Willard Libby invented carbon dating. And he won a Nobel Prize for it in 1960, okay? And, you know, there's people, you know, how, I always tell people, it's like how Obama won a Nobel Prize. So how, how good could those Nobel Prizes actually be? They don't really mean anything. <laughs> so anyway... The whole the whole prize thing, awards in general, it's all it's all vanity. Uh, it just the the concept of awards, especially you know you go to some of these different Christian websites, it's like oh we were given this award and that award. It's a, that's all pride. It's pride and respecting persons. I, I could care less if you won some award. That, that, all that is is just uh, you're getting res, uh, respect of persons from men. It doesn't it doesn't do anything. Um, even if I, I mean I I would suspect that. We, like, for example, our ministry would never win an award for anything because we irritate people too much. They don't want to give out awards to people who make them angry. I don't tend to make them angry, but that's what happens generally. And we even had a guy that wrote, uh, wrote me this week, and he was apologizing for something. I don't know what it was. Um, he said that he was kind of, he had been rough with me, and he was talking about, uh, talking with another guy, uh, he says he was talking with a guy named uh, Brian Moon, and he's another guy we've... I've I befriended him recently. We've had different chats over email about different subjects, and he's got a real... Um, he has another good ministry. If you haven't seen his, it's called uh, turnfromyouridols.com. He's got a bunch of really good videos on his website, so if you haven't checked him out, I recommend that too. But he, was, he said he was talking with Brian Moon, and actually about me, which I thought was weird, and, and this guy had a... he had had a problem with me, I guess, recently, and he, was, he said he was kind of rough with me. He was apologizing for that. Uh, and and I, I said I told him I said you know I don't even remember it. if he was rough with me I don't even remember at all that he was and I I thought well you know sometimes I'm rough with people too so I guess if somebody's rough with me then I'm just reaping what I sow I guess so that's all I can say to that one but I but I did appreciate that from him because that's that's such a rare person that would that would humble themselves to that that extent and and that was really uplifting to me in comparison to the, a lot of the you know the hate mail and hateful words that I get from people or people that accuse me of false things all the time. You know, I get this kind of mail. To, to receive something like that's kind of nice, so I appreciate that. I don't, I don't like using the word nice. I like to use the word pleasant. It's pleasant to receive something like that. Anyway, wow, I just got off on a really long tangent there. So, let's see here. The Where was I? I was talking about Willard Libby. He received a Nobel Prize, okay, for, for this carbonating stuff. Anyway, so... How how does carbon dating actually work? Let's let's look at the concept here. Okay, you're the you're breathing in Earth's atmosphere, duh, obviously, and the atmosphere is made up of about ninety eight or excuse me seventy eight percent nitrogen. Now almost eighty percent of the, the atmosphere is actually nitrogen. It's not oxygen, right? Now I'm not saying that's the way it's always been, 
because there is a lot of indication that there was more oxygen in Earth's atmosphere prior to the flood, which is something we'll get into when we when we start talking about you know the, um, the that Garden of Eden seminar that I do. We'll we'll talk more about that, and I've got some interesting information on that one. But it's about 21% oxygen, 0.6% carbon dioxide, which is a very small amount, and then there's the remainder is a bunch of mixed random gases, uh, which is a, the, that remainder is a very 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 tiny amount. But almost all of it, okay, we're talking 99% is made up of oxygen and nitrogen together. So there's very, very small traces of carbon-14, what's called carbon-14. It's a radioactive, it's called an isotope. Okay. And th these are things that you learned when you were like middle school. It's stuff that you learned and you memorized long enough to take a test and then you forgot it afterwards because <laughs> who cares who's actually going to use this. But a... Well, there's chemists and stuff that use it, but, you know, most people never use this any, any, at any time, so learning it is almost useless, and children know that, which is why they quickly forget it afterwards. But an atom has protons and neutrons in its nucleus. There's a nucle nuclear core. Nuclear. A nucleus core, excuse me. And if, you're, if you actually want to see images of this to try to follow along, again, for those of you who are listening by audio, you can go onto our website, type in, just type in uh, dating. You can, you can do that into the search bar. You won't get any, any uh, articles on, on romance or anything, but you will get articles on uh, scientific dating. And uh, just type in dating into there, and you're going to find a couple articles we're going to go over today. One of them is carbon dating. We're also going to cover, there's another one called Lies of Evolution uh, Potassium Argon Dating, or KAR dating is what it's called. And we'll discuss that some, too. But you can follow along, and, and we're in the carbon dating one right now, and you can click the link in the description on the YouTube channel if you want to follow along. But you can see where there's a nucleus on the images here, if you guys are looking this up, and it's got protons and neutrons in it, and then there's electrons that, that circle around those. Okay, The electrons have a... they don't weigh anything, Okay, and they have a negative charge. But the, the nucleus, that's what makes the atom weigh something, which is why... Uh, if you see a periodic table, there, you got the, all these letters, and the number below that shows the weight of that particular nucleus, okay? So an isotope has more neutrons in its nucleus than protons, okay? There's always an equal amount for, for, for atoms of, of, a, of a naturally, you know, whatever substance on the, on the periodic table that you're talking about, whatever um, chemical or gas that you're talking about, when it's in its normal form, it has uh, an, the, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus are always equal to each other. So it has two and two, or three and three, or four and four, something like that. Okay, And what's called an isotope is something that has extra neutrons in it. So if the core, the nucleus, is what makes it weigh more, when you add extra neutrons, it's actually going to increase the weight of, of what it is. Okay, Now a radioactive isotope is something that has an unstable nucleus, okay, that decomposes. So it has extra, a radioactive isotope has extra neutrons, and those neutrons eventually break down back into what it was before, okay? Blah, 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 who cares? Well, I want to make sure I explain this so people understand that I do understand how the process works. Now, carbon has an atomic weight of 12, and nitrogen has an atomic weight of 14. So what happens, remember I told you that the, the about 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So radioactive carbon is created when the sun's rays strike nitrogen and turns it into a radioactive uh, substance, okay? So what it does is it radioactive and it, it basically breaks down some of what's in there. It causes a radioactive isotope which basically breaks back down into carbon later. So blah blah blah, that whole thing's complex. You guys are like, well, this is boring. What's your point? Okay. Well, all the radioactivity in it breaks down. It has what's called a half-life. Half-lives, basically, it would take almost 6,000 years, on average, for the half-life of carbon-14. So if you had uh, however much radioactivity there is, half of that will break down in 6,000 years. I guess if I were to give an example to help you understand this better, uh, the, the half-life of a cookie in Chris's hand is probably about three seconds. So what I'll do is I'll take a bite and half the cookie will be gone in approximately three seconds, or four seconds. Well, it depends on how long I have to take to chew it and how hard the cookie is. But if you have, if you bite into that, half the cookie is gone. It takes me a few seconds to chew. So between two and four seconds is the half-life of the cookie. Then I can take that, that, the remaining half and bite half of that. 
Okay, now I have uh, half of the remaining half, of which it takes another two to four seconds for me to chew. Okay, then I can bite half of that. And so that's a half-life, that's how it works. Okay, so in theory, what happens is that the, the half, half of the radioactivity decays in 6,000 years. Then in 12,000 years, half of that's gone. So you'll have one quarter of the original left. Then in another 6,000 years, half of that's gone, so you go down to one eighth. Then in another 6,000 years, half of that's gone, you go down to one sixteenth, and then one thirty second, and that's how it works. So uh, the original way this, th th this was being tested, okay, is what they would use what's called a Geiger counter. And I guess I'll turn this up and let you listen to it. There's a video on here um, of a Geiger counter. Uh, somebody's using one on a, I left the video on here, on an old uranium bottle when they used to have, it had trace amounts of radioactivity in it. And if you can listen here, if you hear that clicking sound, that is the clicking sound that you'll hear on a Geiger counter. So Geiger counters, what would happen is that if you would say, hold a Geiger counter up, you would measure the amount of clicks per minute you're getting on a particular object. This is how they were dating things. So let's say you had 16 clicks per minute, then you would have a, a certain amount of C14 in there, okay, in the object. It was radioactive. Then if you had, if you only got 8 clicks per minute, then you would say, okay, well this is approximately 6,000 years old because we're only getting 8 clicks per minute, so half of it's decayed. Then if you only got four clicks per minute, you would say it's 12,000 years old. If it was two cl clicks per minute, it's now 18,000 years old. And then two clicks per minute would be 24,000. One click per minute would be 30,000. Then one click every two minutes would be uh, 36,000, and on and up it goes. Well, once you get down to that much, how, how can you actually measure it? It becomes really difficult to measure after that point. So. What they're saying is that carbon dating is really not good to date anything beyond 50,000 years. I would question 50,000, but let's give it to them, let's say 50,000. Okay, so now you guys understand basically how this works, all right? So the first thing I want to mention is that there's no actual measuring standard for C14. If you guys were, were thinking about measuring a house, okay, you guys are building, let's, let's say you're building a shed or building a tree house or something like that. There's two of you working on different aspects of the sh shed you're building or whatever. But both of, you, both of you are using a ruler to measure, but your rulers are actually different lengths. There's different standards for an inch. So one of you is holding a ruler that's like 13 and a half inches on a standard measure, and another of you is holding a ruler that's 11 inches on a standard measure. If both of you are different, working on different parts of the shed, how is that going to come out when you're done? It's going to be all lopsided. It's going to be weird. It just won't fit together properly. You both have to be using a, a standard of measurement. That's why we have something called a National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is called NIST. Okay, that's for short. That's what that's called. So they, they actually they have <laughs> what I've heard is that in order to measure the standard, they have a ruler behind a, a like a steel door that's like made of like um, titanium or something like that they have this ruler that's a standard measure it's, it's almost like it's holy and sacred there it is you know they have to keep it behind closed doors but you do have to have a standard of measurement otherwise you know there's all sorts of things people can just make uh, they could start selling rulers that were based on what they they considered an inch based on their own you know standards and measurements and that's that was causing problems a long time ago which is why we needed to do that so anyway I just want to make that note that you have to have the same standard of measurement so we need to understand in order to measure how much C14 is in something you have to have I mean you can measure how much is in something but then you you are assuming that whatever is in the object like if you're if, if you're carbon-14 dating a dead animal, okay, you are assuming how much C14 the animal actually took in because, again, C14 is invisible. So you need to have a standard, of, if you're going to be carbon-14 dating, especially anything that's in the past, like all these objects, though, you hear about them, okay, they carbon dated this ancient text and it's, it's this old. You guys, have, you guys have all heard that on these shows. Okay, well, if you're going to do something like that, you're assuming how much C14 was in the atmosphere at the time? Are you? Absolutely they are. 
How can you possibly know how much C14 was in the atmosphere at any given date in history? In fact, they don't even know how much is in there now, and we'll get to that in a minute. But let's say I was going to I was going to ask you guys, I want you to find a consistent number of grasshoppers in the world. You guys tell me, give me some ideas. How would you go about trying to find out how many grasshoppers there are in the world right now? I don't think can. <laughs> that's, that's like, I can't give you an idea because how, exactly, it's not even conceivable how you could do that. That's kind of my point. You would literally have to be in all places in the world at the same time. You would have to be omnipresent in order to determine how many grasshoppers there are in the world, let alone be able to, you know, count that many. Because you could say, well, we could do things like polls. You know, we could poll a certain area and find out how many grasshoppers there are in that area and then extrapolate that to a larger region. Then we could do that with different regions all over the world. Well, you don't know that the grasshoppers that are in your backyard is the same as in your neighbor's yard. You said, yeah, but it's averaging out. Well, you don't know that. You don't know that the grasshoppers in your county are the same as the ones in the next county. There can be completely different. I mean, it, temperatures and weather and conditions could all be different. Grasshoppers will differ between states. They could definitely differ between countries. You don't know that what's happening here is the same as what's happening on the other side of the world. So, the same. Now, this is for something grasshoppers, which you can see, and which you can touch, and which you can hear. But C14 is not detectable by any of our five senses. <laughs> this is going way, way, way beyond what what we're capable of achieving now. Right now in our atmosphere, no one has ever determined what the standard of C14 is in our atmosphere right now. What I've heard is that it has been measured in a couple places in the atmosphere. There's a few times it's been measured in the atmosphere, but what I've heard is that they've, they've measured it in the upper layers of our atmosphere, which doesn't apply to where we are right here and breathing right here. How do you know what's up there? is the same as what's here. They don't know that. This is all assumed to be true. I'm trying to point out these are the major assumptions that you've got to get past before you can even measure these things. So if you don't have a standard of measurement, just like you know you have to have a standard inch on a ruler, how are you going to have a standard of measurement for carbon dating? They don't have one. And there are many evolutionists that know this. They know it. However, they have to believe in it anyway because, again, this is a parlor trick to make this seem scientific. Now, there are uh, plants and animals that have been carbon dated, and the carbon dating should, uh, it absolutely does not work. The Antarctic Journal, Volume 6, posted that a freshly killed seal was carbon dated to be 1,300 years old. It carbon dated out as if the seal had been dead for 1,300 years. Then shells from a living snails were carbon dated at 27,000 years old. That was from Science, Volume 224. Okay, the actual practical application of carbon dating has shown it doesn't work. Now, of course, the evolutionists, as soon as I say this, they probably have already turned it off. Turned, you know, even if they were listening to this audio, uh, they probably already turned it off. And say, huh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, look, we know why those snails there, why they didn't carbon date at 27,000 years old. We know why that happened. It's a phenomenon which they called old carbon that's in the water on the ocean floor. And they said, well, this, this uh, water is, is uh, on the ocean floor. It's producing extra carbon. And therefore, it produces extra carbon, and they get more C14. Okay, well, first of all, the, <laughs> it depends. I, 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 I'll take their word for it. We'll go ahead and say, I'm not, I'm not sure that's actually correct. I want to say this too. Now, I don't know that this is, I don't know if I'll go this far either. But I was trying to search online. I never could find it. I heard of a guy one time, a scientist uh, out of, I can't remember, it was the southern United States somewhere. A scientist that was offering a few thousand dollars to anyone who could prove that carbon-14 actually exists. Interesting. I, I don't know I'd take it that far. I will I will say, yes, carbon-14 exists right now, unless I can have somebody that can give a really good case 
for it not existing, I would, I'm open to reading that. If anybody knows anything about that, you know, send it to me. You know, go into our website, click on contact, email it to me. I'd certainly like to see that. I'd be open to reading it. But uh, anyway, let's you know, let's let's go ahead and assume that what they're saying is correct. It's adding in this whole carbon. The only thing that proves is that they don't know that any of the carbon dates that they do are accurate. They say, oh, well, we know why this one didn't work. Well, how do you know that any of them do work then? How do you know that, that any of the samples that you have have not been contaminated somehow? Well, you see, they don't know that. They are assuming that the object being dated is the same as the C14 in the atmosphere when the creature, when it dies, and they're assuming it's never been contaminated to add an extra C14 or less, or, or even, even if somehow it did not have, you see, the less C14 it could have, it, maybe it has less in it than it should have because the atmosphere did not have as much carbon-14 in it as, as it used to, which we're going to see later that the Earth is constantly making new C14, that's how it's happening. So if the Earth were actually younger and there's, there would be more C14 in the atmosphere today than there was a hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago, or four thousand years ago. Okay, so there could be less C14 in them, which means they're not dating properly. They also could be contaminated, which would make them much older than they were, and none of these things can be verified. There's no possible way they could verify those things. And there's reasons you can't verify that stuff. And I'll go into the candle example. This is one that evolutionists, I've talked to many evolutionists and given this example, they hate this example because it explains to people very simplistically how it works and why you can't use this to actually understand when something was, um, or the age of something at all. So let's imagine that you walk into a room and there's a candle burning on a table. We want to find out when the candle was lit because obviously it was. I don't care what you believe about it, okay, whether you believe, okay, somebody lit this thing, or oh, no, we don't want to believe that somebody lit it. We're going to imagine that lightning struck a tree outside, and there were some sparks that flew off of it and happened to strike the tip of the candle, and it lit it that way. Okay, well, if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. Let's, <laughs> let's uh, you know, believe whatever you want. For the sake of the argument, we're just, we're walking in the room, candles on the table. We want to find out when this wick started burning. So, Let's measure how tall it is. Okay, we find out, we measure with a ruler, we find out it's six inches tall. Can anybody tell me when it was lit? Not without assuming how tall the candle was before it was lit. You would have to assume that first, right? Okay, well let's analyze the rate of burn. Let's look at, we're measuring, we measure it out and we find out it's burning exactly one inch per hour. Can anybody tell me when the candle was lit? Not unless we assume how tall it was and if it's always burned at the same rate. How do you know it's always burned one inch per hour? Now I had some uh, evolutionists that thought, oh well I'm going to be smart, I know how to answer his thing. We're, we can, because we're scientists and so we would take the melted wax and we would restore the melted wax and find out how tall the candle was. We can measure all that out. Well, there are numerous problems with that. This makes it even more complex because, first of all, anybody who makes candles knows that the candle wax, some of it evaporates, irretrievably lost, which means you can't, just like you can't take all the wax from a previously burned candle and make a candle as tall as it was before. You can remake, you can recycle old wax, old candle wax, you can do that, but if you keep recycling the wax from the same candle, eventually you're not going to have a candle anymore because the wax will evaporate. So, first of all, you're not going to be able to find out what the total height of it is from the candle wax because it evaporated. And second, you're assuming that the bottom part of the candle that has not melted yet is the exact same shape and mass as the top of the candle. You don't know that. You don't know what shape this can... People make candles in all sorts of shapes and sizes today. They can form wax into all sorts of different, you know, cute things that people put in their houses. Some people don't even burn the candles. They just get the wax figurine and put it up somewhere, okay? Um, but you're assuming the bottom is the same as the top when it started. So, you don't know that either. There's only one way 
you can tell when that candle was lit. I don't care what scientific devices you have, how many PhDs you've got, there is no way you can tell when that candle was lit unless you go ask the person who lit the candle. In the same respect, there is no way you can tell the age of these things unless you go ask, ask the person who made it. As well as there is no way to tell the age of this earth unless you go, ask the, go back and ask the person who was there when it was made. And the only thing we've got to tell us when this world was made is from the testimony of the Christian God of the Bible, which is in Genesis 1.1. We have, as Christians, more evidence of the age of this world than the evolutionist does. Far, far more. We have the only piece of evidence that's available, which is eyewitness testimony from historical record. Now, whether or not you want to believe that, that's a whole different story. But we have more than the evolutionist does. They have nothing. It's, a, it's all these, um, it's these parlor tricks that are based on just towers of assumptions. They have to make all these mental gymnastics to make this fit. So again, to rely on carbonating, you have to assume how much C14 was there to begin with. Remember, we talked about in the atmosphere. You have to assume, how has C14 always decayed at the same rate? We don't know that. And you have to assume that C14 can come from no other source except the one that they breathed in from the atmosphere. You see, plants are breathing in carbon dioxide. I should have mentioned this earlier. Plants, plants are breathing in carbon dioxide, which then they take C14 because again carbon dioxide consists of carbon. Hey, They take in C14 to their bodies and then animals eat the plants and then you eat plants or eat animals that ate plants and so you take that into your body as well. Okay, You breathe oxygen, they breathe carbon dioxide, but they, you know, some, somehow the C14 is getting into everyone. But you see then you're assuming that the C14 in the atmosphere has always been the same. And remember that the evolutionist has it believes that the earth is billions of years old which means they believe that the C14 in the atmosphere has not changed for at least hundreds of thousands of years to make carbon dating I mean, it, really it's never changed how do you know that again they don't okay now on top of that carbon 14 is actually going to show us and it gives, we have evidence through that that the, the Earth is actually not old. And I'll show you what I mean. When Willard Libby first invented carbon dating, uh, he was doing some calculations about you know, how fast this would actually reach what's called equilibrium. I'm going to explain all this um, in just a moment. But he said, if you got a brand new Earth, poof, it's, it's there. It was not there, and poof, it's here. Started spinning it around the sun. He said you would get, you would reach equilibrium in the atmosphere in approximately 30,000 years. Now, I've never had an, I, I don't have the, the exact references where he said this, but I've never had an evolutionist argue this one either. Uh, in fact, I've read some evolutionary publications that said, yes, that's, that is exactly what he said. Okay, well, equilibrium, if you imagine a barrel with water in it, which I have images on this, uh, of this on here, okay, in, in the article. If you imagine that there's water, like, I, okay, I gave you a job to fill up a barrel with water, and I gave you a hose, and I turned it on at a certain rate, okay? And so you're standing there pouring the hose, into, or putting the hose into the barrel, and you're filling it with water. It's filling in at a, at a constant rate, okay? But I had drilled holes up the side of the, the other side of the barrel. So as it starts to fill up, it starts to leak out a little bit. And then as it fills up more, it leaks out more. As it fills up more, it leaks out more until it reaches a stage where the outtake, the outgo, is equal to the intake. Which means the water will fill up very slowly until a certain point and then it stops. It can't go any higher unless you increase the uh, intake or you de decrease the outgo. This is what's called equilibrium. The same way this works, C14 is constantly, like I said, the sun's rays are striking nitrogen, so it's constantly creating new C14 in the atmosphere. But there's a half-life, which is like the holes on the other side of the barrel. It's constantly leaking out as well. Eventually, the C14 is going to rise, and it's leaking out, and there's going to be a certain point where it's going to reach equilibrium. It's going to stop. Okay, And so the, the amount that's going into the atmosphere is going to be equal to that which is, going, which is decaying and leaving the atmosphere. Not leaving the atmosphere, but it's decaying, it's, it's disappearing. So, Willard Libby says, 30,000 years, the Earth would reach equilibrium. Well, here's the problem. 
uh, in American Antiquity uh, Science uh, Journal, Volume 50, it says radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying. Oh, we got a problem here. Because not only does that indicate that the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, that means it's probably much less than 30,000 years old. Okay, so therein becomes, I mean, this creates a really serious problem for them because that actually indicates the Earth is young. Now, I had one guy when I pointed this out, um, I forget who I was, I think it was over email, because a lot of these guys, I invite them to come on our podcast show and they don't want to come on there and talk about evolution, so they want to do it, you know, via email, or they want to do it on YouTube, where they can just, you know, uh, monster troll on there and just say whatever they want and think that they've won an argument somehow. But they, uh, I had one guy say, well, you know, he says, the magnetic field of the Earth fluctuates. Okay? It fluctuates, and, and that magnetic field of the Earth actually prevents certain carbon-14 from forming because the magnetic field, whether it's stronger or weaker at, at, at different times, fluctuate the, the radioactivity that's being formed in the atmosphere. He's right. But then my question is, now how could you possibly ever get a constant rate of C14 in the atmosphere? If the magnetic field of the Earth is fluctuating, then you're going to have some places that have more C14, other places that have less C14, which means you just totally destroyed your own theory of carbon-14 dating. You see, every time they try to fix the problem, it makes it worse. <laughs> every time. Uh, it simply does not work, folks. It is a parlor trick, and I'm going to show you right, a little more right now what this is. Before we continue on with this, because we're going to get to that section that says radiometric dates are cherry-picked, I'm going to switch over to the article on carbon-14 dating. It's called KAR dating, all right? And we're going to discuss this a little bit. So the half-life, now, of course, we're talking about carbon-14 dating. Now, uh, potassium-argon dating has a half-life of 1.3 billion years, now, first of all, I would question how they know that. I, uh, I'm not sure that they actually know that, but I'll grant that to them. Let's go ahead and assume it's 1.3 billion years. Whether it is or not actually doesn't really matter in, in this, uh, this discussion. So, uh, I'll read this to you from uh, the University of California. Uh, this is on their um, ucsb.edu uh, website. It says, quote, geologists have used this method to date rocks as much as 4 billion years old. It is based on the fact that some of the radioactive isotope of potassium, potassium-40, that's K-40, decays into the gas argon as argon-40, or, or AR-40. By comparing the proportion of K-40 to AR-40 in a sample of volcanic rock and knowing the decay rate of K-40, the date that the rock formed can be determined. End quote. Okay, so blah, they're like, blah, 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 what did that mean? Well, that just means they're comparing potassium to argon and, show, and in comparison to the decay rate of potassium, okay? Uh, and so potassium over time decays into argon, okay, which is why they call it potassium argon dating. So it's got, like I said, after 1.3 billion years, half of, half of the, the half of it's going to decay. After another 1.3 billion years, another half is going to decay. On and on it goes. You guys understand how that works now. So, there are some problems with this, and I'm going to try to go over this as as much much as I can without confusing too many people. Okay, because there this the logical concept behind it should be very clear once we're done with this. I hope. I hope. Okay. Number one, remember how we talked about the, the C14, there's a contamination problem? That they don't know how anything, any of the dates could be right or wrong because they don't know if any of it's been contaminated. Well, the same happens with potassium argon dating, okay? This is from Planetary Sciences Abstracts, Science, Science Journal, uh, volume, one, uh, volume 48, issue 11. It says, quote, as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample of iron meteorite can be removed by distilled water in 4.5 hours, end quote. Excuse me? You're telling me that 80% of your sample, I mean, of your, what you're trying to, to get this potassium in there can be removed by water? <laughs> you're, and, but what they believe, now get this, but they believe that their samples have not been contaminated for billions and billions of years. They believe it's all been consistent. 
uh, that's a really, really big stretch. That's an enormous stretch of the imagination. Uh, number two problem, there's inconsistency of de rates of decay. Are you telling me that the decay rate of potassium, potassium has never changed in billions of years? Of course, they believe no. On what basis do they believe that? There is no basis. That's just, it's called a presupposition, okay? They presuppose it to be true, but they have no evidence of this. They call it science and say, oh, this is scientific fact. We've proven this. No, you haven't. They've never even attempted to do it because there's no possible way to do that. They're assuming that the decay rates they see today are the way it's always been in the past. Again, that's the uniformitarian assumption. You know, the way things are happening now are the way they've always been happening. Then, the next problem we have is that known ages, ages that you know, you, you take a sample of an object, you know what its age is, and then you try to date it with potassium argon dating, it doesn't work. This is from, actually, uh, well, from a number of sources I have on here that you can read different books and, and things like that. You can get uh, samples of it from a book called The, the Human History Mistake. There's also uh, Steve Austin's uh, article on uh, Is the Lava Dome at Mount St. Helens Really a, a Million Years Old? It says, quote, In June of 1992, Dr. Austin collected a 15-pound block of dacite from, the high, from high on the lava dome. A portion of the sample was crushed, sieved, and, and processed into a whole rock powder, as well as four mineral, mineral concentrates. These were submitted for potassium argon analysis to Geochron Laboratories of Cambridge. The only information provided to the laboratory was that the samples came from dacite and that low argon should be expected, meaning that they're younger. Okay, They didn't tell them anywhere where they found it. That's, that's the key point you want to make sure you remember here because we're going, to, we're going to need that for later. It continues and says, The laboratory was not told that the specimen came from the lava dome at Mount St. Helens and was only 10 years old, end quote. Okay? So what happens is that, according to them, volcanic rock is the best way to date ages with potassium argon dating because theori theoretically, when a volcano erupts, all the argon gas is released from the rock. And then so what it does is it kind of resets the clock back to zero, right? So whatever, what they'll do is that, okay, potassium is decaying to argon, okay? It's building up argon gas in there. So supposedly, according to them, if it's gone through two half-lives, when they're grinding and crushing this up, they obviously have to do an averaging of what's in there. If it's decayed through two half-lives, then it's supposed to be 2.6 billion years old, right? Theoretically, that's how it's supposed to work. But there's a problem with this. Because the lab results that came back, when they sent these to this laboratory, they didn't tell them where it came from. They just said, would you, would you potassium argon date this for us and tell us what you get from it? The whole rock that they, that they sent to them, the one that wasn't crushed down, the whole rock was about 0.35 million years. Okay, which is going to roughly come out to about 350,000 years old. From 10-year-old volcanic rock. Uh, the feldspar came out to about 340,000 years old. The amphibole, they call it, is, came out to be about 900,000 years old. The pyrazine came out to be 1.7 million years old. And the am amphibole, these different types of uh, different specimens that they're getting from this area, came out to be 2.8 million years old using potassium argon dating on 10-year-old rock. When you test it with ages that you know, this process does not work. So why don't they, I mean, here's a question, why haven't the science journals published these findings? Of course, they will give any excuse. I don't care what it is, you'll find evolutionists that will give 1,500 excuses of why they didn't do it. You know, the samples were contaminated, they didn't use the proper equipment, the, the right people weren't doing it, they didn't have the right degrees. They have an excuse every time because, remember, as I, as I pointed out in that video you guys saw me put out this past week, the religion of evolutionism is not falsifiable because it's not science. It doesn't matter what they find, they will find an excuse to fit it into the evolution model because, again, they presuppose it to be true before they ever approach evidence. 
this is a quotation from the Canadian Journal of Sciences, volume uh, 16. It says, quote, in conventional interpretation of KAR potassium argon age data, data, it is common to discard ages, discard ages, which are substantially too high or too low compared with the rest of the group, which, what are, the, what are they already saying? They get a group of numbers and they get wild numbers all over the board. It's, and it continues and says, or with other available data, such as the geologic time scale, end quote. That is my point right there. They throw out ages, if they're too high or too low, based on the geologic column. And that's exactly what I was talking about last week. When you remember we were talking about the different layers in the geologic column and that every, it's the Bible for the evolutionists, everything has to be compared to that. They don't get ages from radiometric dating. Don't let them fool you. Don't let the textbooks fool you. That's not how they get them. They get a wide range of numbers, and that's why I put these images on here to try to help explain this to people, okay? What the evolutionist does is they start out saying, okay, I have this sample of rock. I already know that this is 10 million years old because I, I know where I found this, and the geologic column says it's 10 million years old. So when they go in the uh, potassium, or, you know, like potassium argon dating or any radiometric dating method, because they have all sorts of them, they have, you know, radium scrotium dating, lead to uranium, 238, and things like that. They have all sorts of different ones that they use. But they'll get a sample, they'll have one that says 300 million years, they'll have one that says 24,000 years, they'll have one that says 4.8 million years, they'll have another one that says 5.2, or 5,200 years, and then they'll have one that comes out that says 9.7 million years. And they'll say, ah, I see 9.7, that's close to the 10 million that I already believe. So therefore, we will take that and say we radiometric dated it and it's science. And I proved it with science. That's the kind of thing that they do. This is a magician's trick. And, and they, they dupe themselves into believing that this is somehow part of science. And they lie and deceive other people and students into believing, making them believe that this is part of science too, and it's not. Again, that's how they do it. They take these multiple dates, and the one that they cherry pick is the one, that, it's whatever one the geologic column says it is, which is why they need to know where you found it. You see, there are people that have brought in dinosaur bones to different laboratories around the country. There was one guy that did this out in Ohio. I forget what his name is. I would love to have the, I couldn't find the documentation of it online. I'd love to have the documentation of him doing this. He would take a dinosaur bone in, but you can't tell them it's a dinosaur bone, okay? Because in, into, a, into a lab where they would do carbon dating. Because if you took in a bone and you said, this is a dinosaur bone, would you carbon date this? And they say, nope, it's too old. Because again, carbon dating is not good for over, for over 50,000 years. And so if they date it, they will get ages. They're supposed to get ages older than 50,000 years. Because again, the dinosaurs, again, according to their theory, were supposed to go extinct 65 million years ago. But you see, what they'll do is date it and end up getting young dates, and they'll say, well, these obviously be, are wrong. How do they know those carbon dates are wrong? Well, because the geologic column says that they're, that they're older than that. Aha, again, all of it is based on their Bible, the geologic column, which is made up from pure imagination and is based on circular reasoning, which we will find out later. I don't think we'll get to that this week, but we will find that out later. <laughs> so, now, the next problem, this gets even worse, okay? Because the unknown ages, now you see, they, there have been people that have brought dinosaur bones in to be carbon dated, and they found, uh, they got young ages with the carbon dates they put in them. Did you realize that they've actually carbon dated diamonds, which the evolutionists say take millions of years to form, which is completely not true? They've carbon dated diamonds and found carbon in them. If diamonds took, the not carbon, but carbon-14 is found in them. If diamonds took millions of years to form, there is no way they would find traces of C14 in them. But they do. And that's because diamonds don't take millions of years to form. Okay? Now, in 1970, now the unknown ages are assumed to work. If you don't know the age of the rock or whatever substance that you're testing, it's assumed to work. In 1970, Nature Magazine, that was their April 18th, page 226, you can go check this out for yourself, and many, many other publications. It wasn't just Nature they were dating volcanic rock from what's known as the KBS Tuff out in Kenya. The KBS Tuff was named after uh, a lady named Kay Brenzenmeyer, okay? Because every evolutionist, they want to 
they said, okay, I'm digging the ground. I found some rocks. I got to put my name on them so I can get famous. <laughs> That's what they all do. All right. So anyway, almost every evolutionary publication journal scientists agreed back in 1970 based on radiometric, this radiometric dating, the potassium argon dating is what they used on it. The KBS Tuff was 212 to 230 million years old which I still think is a really wide margin for error, but let's, okay, let's say they, they, they did it, it's 230 million years old. Everybody agreed. There was no question of this. They then used this as what they called an event horizon, because remember when I said the, the volcano, volcano explodes, it resets the clock back to zero, so they call that an event horizon, meaning that everything around that area can be dated based on that volcanic rock, that age, age layer that they got, okay, from this volcano. He says 230 million years old. In 1972, an evolutionist by the name of Richard Leakey was digging in that KBS tuff, and he found a human skull. The skull's number in uh, log was uh, KNMER1470. I forget how I used to know how what those different letters meant, but I don't I don't remember anymore. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Who cares? That's just if you want to look that up, you can. Somebody who who wants to get real technical on that. Now, he found a human skull in the KBS Tuff. Well, think about that for a moment. Humans, human beings, or the, the ape-like ancestors, or the, you know, the human ancestors that they were supposed to be having these skulls from, would have at maximum only appeared on the Earth, according to their theory, three million years ago. But really, around 500,000 years ago would be more accurate. So, they found this skull dating a human at, let's, let's call it a million years, in 230 million year old rock. What should they do? Well, they should go back to, if potassium argon dating works, as they keep claiming that it does, they should go back to their geologic column and reorganize it to put humans on the Earth at 230 million years ago. Is that what they did? No. They redated the KBS Tough. Stop right there. Right there. They know it doesn't work. They know it. These evolutionists understand full well that, that radiometric dating is used to date absolutely nothing. It's a parlor trick. It is something used to impress the public so they can get more grant money and sell more books. That's all it's for. Evolutionists are using the imaginary geologic column, not any scientific method. Okay. Now watch this. This is what happened. Okay. This is from uh, you can you can check this out also. This is quoting. This is Marvin Lubinow and his Bones of Contention. It's quoting out of uh, Nature, Volume Two Forty Seven. He says, "Quote: Late in 1974, Fitch, Miller, and Associates published their res the results of their revised study." A broad scatter of apparent ages from 10 different samplings ranging from 0.52 to 2.64 million years, end quote. These are the new dates that they got from the KBS Tuff. First thing I want to point out, 0.5 to 2.5 is a 500% error margin. <laughs> but it's science. This is science, okay? It's not science. This is a religion. This is a religious cult. Not to mention, that is a really, really large... I mean, they want to say, we know absolutely that it's 230 million years old. Everyone agreed on this. Now, suddenly, two years later, everyone agrees. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's got to be uh, 0.5 to 2.5, somewhere around that range. Why did they date it 0.5 to 2.5? Because that's when they needed... That's when the geologic column says humans were alive. Because nobody could, could they could say, well, did somebody, like, bury the skull here or something like that? No, it was proven that it was, it was brought up from underneath. Nobody could explain that away. So what they had to do was redate, redate it again because it's a parlor trick, okay? This, what's be, the radiometric dating, and that's why I put this image on this article, it's, you know, the SpongeBob, you know, supposed to be in the ocean, and they're, they're sitting by a campfire in the bottom of the ocean. That's why I put radiometric dating. When you've got evolution, who needs science and logic? That's the reason I did that, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter what dates they get. They will cherry-pick only those ones that match the geologic column. That's it. They handle Radiometric dating is almost the same 
as thetan levels in Scientology. You know, they say your thetan levels, you gotta, you got to measure these things to find out, you know, exactly what your thetan levels are in these things. It's, it's handled almost the exact same way. It's a religious cult, and it doesn't actually use any kind of science whatsoever. It just does a lot of complex things to try to fool people into believing it's science when it's really not. It's very simple. Now, these are some ones that I had uh, quoted from uh, the uh, Evolution is Religion, or Evolutionism, Another New Age Religion article that we were doing. Now, I'm going to quote again from New Science Magazine, Volume 100. It says, quote, apart from very modern examples, and by the way, we're going back to the uh, carbon dating article again now, and we're under, now we're under the section that says radiometric dates are cherry-picked. Let's try this one more time. Quote, apart from very modern examples, which are really archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. End quote. Do you see now why they said that? You see now why they're publishing this? In the American Journal of Science, Volume 276, it says, quote, radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. End quote. Can you see why they're saying this now? It's starting to make some sense. The whole thing, again, is just an illusion. This is from the uh, Proceedings of the Twelfth Nobel Symposium in New York under an article uh, that's entitled C-14 Dating in Egyptian Chronology and Radiocarbon Variations in Absolute Chronology. Quote, If a C-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. End quote. Completely out of date with what? How do you know the dates that you're throwing out are incorrect? They don't. How do you know the dates that you're picking are correct? They don't. They just pick, basically, why don't you just put a number on it and throw it out there? Because then people would say, wow, all they're doing is just putting numbers on them and throwing them out there, but they don't have any way that they're doing that. Radiometric dating is simply their excuse for putting any number on it that they want to. This is from the Anthropological Journal of Canada, Volume 19. It says, quote, no matter how useful, he put in quotations, it is, though, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative. The accept and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. And that's exactly what I just said. He continues and says, this whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends on which funny paper you read, end quote. Again, can you see why they're saying this now? It is based on that. So here's some other arguments you're going to hear from evolutionists about this. They're going to say, well, tree ring dating proves that carbon dating works. It's, it, what they're using is something called dendrochronology. Dendro, you know, has to do with trees, and chronology, you know, chrono, that has to do with time. So it's, it's trees over time, right? That's basically what the word means. Or the ology is the study of, so the study of trees over time. Dendrochronology is the science dealing with the study of the annual rings of trees in determining the dates and chronological order of past events. Now that was from dictionary.com. I was, I was going over the, the definition of dendrochronology. So they call them annual rings, okay? Here's how tree dating works. What they do is they have a, they have a drill, what they call a core drill. It's this long thing, long device that they put into a tree and they twist and they drill it into the, to the uh, trunk of a tree they pull it back out, and it's got a hole in the middle of it. It's like, a, it's like a tiny pipe. It's got a hole in the middle of it. Put it into the tree, pull it back out, and it pulls out a rod that is, you can see, all the rings of a tree. So it's like a little wooden rod that comes out of it. And each ring, what they do is they count all the rings on the tree. You guys have seen this done before. They count the rings on the tree, and so if they count 100 rings, supposedly the tree is supposed to be 100 years old because they call them annual rings. However, this assumes that the rings are annual. That has never been proven. In fact, it's actually been proven that they're not annual rings. Okay, I'm not saying that a ring on a tree cannot form in one year, but they are not annual rings. All right. There's a guy I was trying to find a long time ago. I never did find the guy. I was, I was trying to look up some stuff on that. I heard of a guy a long time ago who was, what he was doing was growing trees. There's some people that would grow trees, just specific trees for the lumber and the wood. And he was growing trees for seven years. Every time they cut them down, they always have 11 rings on them. Well, wait a second. I thought they were annual rings. How can you have 11 rings in seven years? Because they're not annual rings. And there's the problem. 
there are many, and I, I reference you some uh, different things you can read. Creation Research Journal uh, Quarterly, Volume 29. Number four of March 1993, you can read that. It talks about, it has an article called uh, Tree Ring Dating and Multiple Growth Ring Per Year. Um, I didn't pull out any particular quotes from that because the entire thing is basically something you'd have to read uh, to get that. But you can look that up online. I, I've seen it before. There's another one proving that. It's also called, uh, that's, that's from Dwayne Gish and from the Creation Research Journal Quarterly, again from Volume 26. He, he writes on this one again. Another issue called uh, uh, More Creationist Research Part 2 Biological Research, where he talks about the, uh, the tree rings are producing more, and one, more than one in a year. You can actually get many rings in one year, depending on the climate. They don't know exactly what's causing the rings. No scientist has ever been able to determine that conclusively, but it's suspected that it's going based on humid to dry weather, depending on like seasonal changes and things like that, or the climate. So if it's if it's drier out, it'll produce one one shade of ring, and then again another shade if it's it's more humid out, depending on you know of it growing because of the it's the way the tree actually forms, you know behind the bark with the sap and all that. There's a there's a whole long explanation um, that I really ought to add into this. I actually I, I hadn't considered that. Maybe I should add in a whole section about how the the trees actually grow. Maybe I'll do that eventually, but I don't have time right now. Anyway, what they do is part of the, the evolutionists typically point to what's called bristlecone pines. Now, if you're watching this through the website, you see this tree. I, I got a picture of a bristlecone pine on here. This thing looks like someone took the tips of, of the branches and just started twisting the thing. It is a, these bristlecone pines are just a tangled, gnarled mess. Now, remember I told you how they, they put a, a core through the trunk of a tree and date it. Tell me exactly where you would put the device, where the tree starts and ends on the trunk of this to where you could put in a core and get an accurate sample of how old these trees are. Uh, not sure exactly what you're, where you're going to be able to get something accurate on that, okay? So nobody's really ever proven that either. However, they have one they call the oldest tree in the world. They say the tree's name, the tree's name is Methuselah, and it's one of these bristlecone pines. They won't even give the location of where it's at. And you say, well, that's kind of suspect, isn't it? Well, I can understand it, because what happens if they, if they give out the name of, hey, this is the oldest tree in the world, there's going to be a bunch of people that are going to go out, find out where this tree is, and start taking a piece off of it and say, hey, I have wood from the oldest tree in the world. This is, the whole concept is really stupid. But they named this cone uh, Methuselah, which is after the longest living man in the genealogy of the Bible. I'm not, I'm not saying he's the longest living man ever, but in the genealogy of the Bible, he's the longest living one. So uh, this, this is apparently supposed to be located in the White Mountains in California. And they said they found 4,789 rings in it. This was back in 1957. Just because, though, they found... 4,789 rings in it doesn't mean that it's 4,789 years old. This is almost a childish, childish way of approaching this, okay? Um, and so what they're trying to say is, well, you say the flood was 4,400 years ago, and we have a tree that's 4,700 years old, therefore the Bible's wrong. That is absolutely not true, because again, they're making major assumptions. Uh... Let's see here. This is, um, uh, yeah, I have a reference on here from the Creation Research Journal, again, volume 20. Dr. Walter E. Lambert's Ph.D. in genetics ran experiments in Freedom, California that demonstrated that, demonstrated the bristlecone pine specifically can produce rings in a, in a year, extra rings in a year, based on the humid, dry climate changes. Interesting. There's already been experiments done to, to demonstrate this. Yet, the evolutionists insist, and this is all over all sorts of mainstream Websites, evolutionary websites, textbooks everywhere, they still teach it's, it's 4,789 years old, but yet it's already been proven that the bristlecone pines produce more than one in a year. I'm not saying every year they do, okay? Because there are some, sometimes a tree would produce one ring in a year. I'm not saying that would happen. It's possible that a tree could produce one ring in two years. We don't know that either. But... There have been many experiments done and shown that this is simply not the case. So what what are they what are they doing here though? The evolutionist argues that radiometric dating, carbon dating, proves dendrochronology. And dendrochronology, which is what we're the tree ring dating, proves carbon dating. It's actually circular reasoning. 
None of them prove anything. They're all based on major assumptions. There's, there's no evidence of anything being brought forth here. Now, another one you're going to hear is they're going to say ice core dating. The ice core dating is proving, you know, that the carbon dating actually works. Okay? And this is a quotation I got from the uh, U.S. National Ice Core Laboratory. It's a government website. It says, quote, an ice core from the right site can contain an uninterrupted, detailed climate record extending back hundreds of thousands of years, end quote. This is what they believe, because most of these evol you know, government websites are supporting of evolution over and over. Therein, it's their website and their organization. You realize your tax dollars are going to pay for evolutionary propaganda. And, and Christians seem to not even bat an eyelash at that as if it doesn't phase them. Uh, that's amazing to me. If I, I mean, if I went up to the school, found out they were teaching Islam in classes up here, if I found that out and I let the town know, people would be turning, on, falling on their ear in outrage that they're teaching Islam up there, they're teaching this religion, this false religion at their school. But I tell them they're teaching evolution up there, nobody bats an eyelash. They're both just as dangerous as the other, okay? These false pagan religions. Anyhow, continuing here. You're going to see pictures here. Now, I posted pictures, and what you're going to see, these little places where you have dark and, and light, same as the tree ring dating, where it has dark and light back and forth, and you can count the rings. They're doing the same with ice cores, except they dig vertically instead of, you know, burrowing horizontally into a tree. Now they dig vertically into, a, into the ground, and they pull out these long tubes of ice, and then they count the rings on them, and they say these are annual rings. Well, let's take a look at an example to show that, and what they call this, by the way, this is called glacial fern. I guess I should explain that, too, of how this actually works, because what happens, and, and you can see this happen, you guys have seen this in just weather, like, basically here in Indiana, or wherever you're living, if, you, if it snows, because those of you who live further down south, it almost never snows. I remember we had some friends that lived down in Alabama, and their 12-year-old son was... Uh, at the time, he's not 12 now, but their 12-year-old son, they talked about snow, and he didn't believe them. He thought they were making up a story, that that wasn't actually real, <laughs> that snow wasn't real, because he'd never really seen it before. So, anyway, but fern is when you'll have a bunch of snowfall, and then the ice, the what happens, it gets a little warmer to where that snow melts a little bit, and then it refreezes again. It gets down below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it refreezes, and then it it creates ice and then more snow falls onto that, it happens again and it keeps compacting. That creates these layers. So what they do is they say because it's gotten warmer and gotten colder, therefore these are representations of the different years. Okay? Because it, it, this rep represents summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. No, it represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You could get five rings in a week in some of the weird weather we've had out here in Indiana let alone in other places around the world, okay? That doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold. So to test this, we take a look at an example of something called the Lost Squadron. Now, as soon as I mention this, evolutionists get angry at this one, too. I've seen multiple of them get angry and just start scoffing. As, oh, you're mentioning the Lost Squadron. The reason they hate this is because it's such a good argument. Is because it's so incredibly... Um, it's incredibly firm in disproving any of their ice core dating theories. Okay, in, in 1942, this was during uh, World War II, uh, there's a group of what they called P-38 planes, and the Germans used to call them the fork-tailed devil because they were so scared of these things. They were incredibly efficient planes, and they did a, did a lot of destruction when they saw them flying overhead. But these P-38s, they were heading from America to England. I've got a map that I draw on here to show you their, their flight path of where they were supposed to go. If you see the red lines here, that's showing where they were taken off from, okay? They were going up from near Boston, going up through Canada, and then they would fly up to Greenland. And then uh, what they were doing is they were flying out, they were going to go over to London, okay? Because they had to keep refueling as they were going through these places. But the problem was they ran into a really bad storm. So they had to turn around, and they had to basically make an emergency landing. Well, there's a, there's a group of these planes that were flying together. So the first one comes in, and they can't see hardly anything. He puts his wheels down. Well, the place he was landing on was really rough ice. So when he put his wheels down, it started to uh, it knocked the plane around, and the plane actually did a flip. The nose hit in, and then it flipped over, flipped the plane upside down. 
The pilots were okay. They got banged up pretty bad, but the pilots were okay, and they radioed into everybody else, hey, do not put your landing gear down. Don't put, don't put down your wheels. Just come in and belly land. So the others came in for some pretty rough landings, and they belly land, and, and they ended up being okay. They were stuck out there in those icy conditions for two weeks, which is pretty rough. Okay, but they, they survived, and they were finally rescued after two weeks. And they call it Greenland. You've got to remember, Iceland is actually green, and Greenland is actually all ice. Okay, That's, <laughs> you need to understand the, the difference between those, okay? So it was kind of rough conditions out there, but they survived, and then they came and got rescued. But they didn't take the planes back. I mean, how do you take off again? You couldn't even hardly land. How are you going to take off on these things? They left the planes there. And after World War II, it was just going to cost too much money to go out there and get those planes. It would, it would cost a huge amount to be able to drive those planes out and get them back where they were, so they just went, well, we'll just leave them there, forget about them. Well, there's a guy um, I, by the name of, I can't remember his name, he's from Kentucky. I don't remember his name right off the top of my head. Anyway, he was a big-time collector in this stuff, he, he liked uh, planes and things like that, so in 1990, about 50 years later, he wanted to restore these planes. So they went out there with ground-penetrating radar to locate these planes. He wanted to find out where they were, and they were going to go dig them up. So, um, what they did is they found out where the planes were, and they actually f found out that they were three miles from where they originally landed because of the movement of the giant glacier in, Gle in Greenland. The glacier had actually moved them three miles, three miles away from where they originally were. And they were trapped under 263 feet of ice. That's a lot of ice in 50 years, okay? Big refrigerator. In Creation Next to Hilo, in 1997, they published, quote, In Greenland and Antarctic, where the weather is co uh, consistently dry and very cold, the glaciers are, glaciers are miles thick, but the annual rings are very thin. The deepest cores can measure over 10,000 feet. Cores from Greenland drilled since 1990 show the northern climate was very erratic 135,000 years ago, end quote. Now, Creation Next Ohio is not teaching this. They're showing what they're teaching is that this is what the evolutionists are saying, okay? And they, I mean, they're sometimes getting 10,000 foot cores. Of course, they don't pull them out at 10,000 feet. They pull them out in different sections. They always cut them, and then they, they number them, and they say, okay, this one connects to this one, this one connects to this one. This is how they organize them um, on that U.S. Ice Core Laboratory, okay? So the Lost Squadron accumulated 253, 263 excuse me, feet of ice in 48 years. So that comes out to an average of 5.5 feet per year. If you have a 10,000 foot ice core sample, divided at that rate, you only have about 1,800 years, not 135,000 years. You see the, see the problem here? It's, it's only the, the evidence of we, we see of accumulation of ice in Greenland is only 5.5 feet a year. So you only have about, they say, oh, okay, well, this, because we have this many feet of ice in Greenland, therefore, it's at least 135,000 years old. No, according to the evidence, it's only about 1,800 years old, that glacier. But you see, they assume a whole lot when they're making these calculations, the evolutionists do. And that's why they get all, so many things wrong, and they end up indoctrinating so many people into a false religion. So Bob Carden is one, uh, one of the guys that helped dig out these P-38 fighter planes, okay? They were, they were digging down to the ice. They had to melt down into this. And I've got pictures of him going down into this thing. You can see him doing this, and you can see all the rings on the side here, okay? Uh, in an interview, he reported that once they got 62 feet down, so about, you know, about a fifth of the way down, they started up pulling up pieces of plywood, they're pulling up chunks of wood out in the middle of a, of a tundra of ice like this? How are they pulling up wood? These are pieces of plywood where another team, back in 1983, tried to dig out the planes. Which means they got buried another 62 feet in seven years. So if you actually calculate that 62 feet, this comes out to about 8 feet per year. 8 foot of ice is being created per year. And he also reported that they dug through many hundreds of layers of ice as they went through 263 feet to get to these planes. Wait a second, how can you have many hundreds of layers of 
of ice in only 48 years. That's because these are not annual rings, okay? This proves that, which is why so many evolutionists hate it when you bring up the Lost Squadron thing, is because that completely disproves their theories on this stuff. So they have nothing that verifies carbon dating. And carbon dating, along with potassium argon dating and all the other dating methods, are logically flawed on multiple levels, things that have never been answered and never will be answered because, as we demonstrated and you guys could see, there's no way to answer them. We don't have methods for determining any of these things. You can't go back through history and find out what, what you know, carbon-14 levels or potassium-argon levels or whatever there were throughout history. You can't do that. And when they've dated samples of known age today, they do not work. The only way to verify things on the age of the Earth is to go back and ask the eyewitnesses who were there. Like the Lord God, who authored Genesis 1-1. And Adam, Adam, who authored Genesis 2, you know, he was there when these things were created. So that's the only way to really verify that. The, really question, the real question is, do you trust in God that he did what he said he did? And the answer for most people is no, they don't trust him. They want to go off on their own way. Well, that's just typical of mankind. That's what they always do. So we'll, we'll end with that today, and then we'll get back to um, talking about more on evolution next week. We'll try to do our best maybe maybe to finish it up, but I'm not sure whether we'll finish it next week or not. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we end? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever had anybody as a get, like, are you exposed to kind of stuff, you know, like, let's say an evolutionist, have you ever, like, had anybody admit that, okay, maybe I was wrong in a situation or something? No. I have never had anybody admit that they were wrong in a particular situation. What I have them do is say, well, I don't know about that. I'll have to look into it. And then I never hear from them again. That, that one has happened, um, actually, if I remember right, if you go back to the video, maybe I'll have to put that video, I'll have to embed that on this article, the video I, I, a podcast I had with the guy who, who came on and talked with me about evolution for a couple hours. That was interesting because when I pointed out to him things like the, um, the layers of rock, which we're going we're gonna to get to, the different layers, um, and the polystrate fossil trees running up through multiple layers connecting them together and how they find fossils of animals connecting different layers and things like that. Uh, when I pointed that out to him, he was just like, well, I I'll have to research that. I don't know. Because he had no answers for that. I asked him because I said, you believe these layers are millions of years of age each, right? And I said, he said, yeah. And then I pointed this out to him and he's like, uh, uh, well, I don't know. I never heard from the guy again afterwards. So I don't know whether you looked them up or not. And even if they do, they will find some excuse to keep that religious idea because, again, it's religious in the, in the sense that they can escape from judgment of God. That's what they really hate, and that's what they're doing all this for. I know it seems, they're like, wow, that's really extreme to go through all this mental gymnastics just for justification. But ye are they that justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. The Bible talks about a lot of people justifying themselves. Anyway, so just the short answer, no, I've never had anybody to say, Hey, I was wrong about that. Never. Anybody have any other questions or comments? Well, thanks for joining us again this week, guys. May our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all as you study his word, and we'll see you next week.